Hi guys, my name is Mansi Anand and I welcome you to this series called RBI 24/7. So as most of you would be knowing that this is a series where we conduct a session of five questions which are usually related to uh, current affairs of finance and economics or we try to take up some static concepts which might be useful for you or the concepts where students face some problems, right? So we are uh, going to do these five questions today. And before we move on to these questions, I would like to ask you guys to subscribe to our channel. So if this is the first video of our channel that you are watching, then do not forget to hit the subscribe button as it can help you to stay associated with us. And pressing this bell icon can help you to get notified whenever a new video by any mentor comes up. You can also join our telegram group where we try to resolve your queries. So moving ahead to question number one for today. Okay, this is your question number one. And this question says, from the below statements, below mentioned statement, select the one which is correct. Okay, this question is a little incomplete. Select the statement, select the statement which is correct in relation to tax buoyancy. In relation to tax buoyancy. Right, so there is a term called tax buoyancy and in relation to that term, you have to select the correct option out of these five. I hope the screen is perfectly visible to you. You can pause the video here and then select your answer. So let's move ahead to the solution. And the solution for this question is question uh, uh, solution B. Option B means tax buoyancy. It refers to the responsiveness Okay, it refers to the responsiveness of the tax revenue growth to changes in GDP, right? So it's a very simple term. See, whenever a nation or a country grows, it uh, the income of people living in it also grows with it, right? And when the income grows, what is going to grow? The tax revenue that they are paying to the government. So basically, uh, governments, they try to boost the economy obviously for the welfare of the people apart from that their revenues are also going to grow if people earn their standard of living rises and they consume more more uh, products and services so uh, if they are increasing their consumption they are increasing their tax payouts in the form of indirect tax and if they uh, and if they pay the tax directly then they are going to increase it in the form of direct tax that is usually applied on income right same goes for companies, if they grow, their tax payouts also increase, right? So, the term that helps us to define the relationship between tax revenue changes for government and GDP, then that particular term is known as tax buoyancy, right? Let's learn some more things about it, okay. The simple fact is that economy achieves faster growth the tax revenue of the government also grows, right? Simple fact that I just told you. So to just try to take an example of your own self, right? If you are earning more money, if you are having a lot of money, then what are you going to do? If you are a shopaholic, you are going to buy a lot of goods, a uh, lot of uh, clothes, a lot of shoes, a lot of gadgets. So whenever you buy this stuff, you pay some amount of tax to the government, right? Which increases in, in which helps in increasing their revenue. And if governments, they have revenue, they have a large revenue by the form of tax collections, then they have to borrow lesser and lesser amount for spending in the economy, right? So this is the plus point that uh, that uh, that uh, incurs to government. Okay, tax buoyancy helps uh, explains this relationship between government's tax revenue growth and changes in GDP. So guys, what if GDP is increasing, but tax revenue growth is not increasing proportionately. That means tax evasion is increasing in the country and government needs to take some strict steps to discourage it, right? So first thing is that government can feel relieved and happy if the economy achieves higher growth, might not have to borrow highly because they are earning revenue from the people of the country itself. So in 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 the, so basically, in indirect terms, the people of the country or the citizens of the country, they are try, they are 
funding the growth of the economy or they are funding the uh, the infrastructural projects that government is taking or they are providing the salaries of the government officials which government is paying right so they are uh, bearing the cost of running the nation right tax buoyancy will be highest for direct taxes because as the economy grows fast the additional income generated may go to the rich group so this is i think a very evident fact that if an economy is growing which is the class which benefits most from it so the most of the benefit it goes to the rich class or the upper class and if their income increases they are going to pay higher taxes on their income because obviously they are shifting to a higher tax bracket let's say for example if in a country we charge 10% income tax on a person who is earning up to 5 lakh and then 20% till 10 lakh right so this is just an example now if someone who used to earn 4 lakh 80000 now this person has an increase of let's say rupees 50000 in his income now his income is lying in the another bracket being 5 lakh 30 thousand right so a higher tax is going to be charged so, so you see how the tax rate is doubled just by shifting of uh, shifting of citizens from a lower tax bracket to a higher tax bracket that is why tax buoyancy is higher for direct taxes but if we consider the case of india this is this is one problematic situation for us that direct taxes the revenue that government generates by the uh, direct taxes that is not very high for india that is why we need to check tax evasion because see the main reason being that uh, there is the the most chunk of population of the country it is not it is not living in very good conditions or it is not uh, earning such a high income that it pays tax to government right so there might be some super rich people in the country but the number of people in proportion to the population that we have is very less that is why direct tax coverage in country is not very high and if we need to increase if government needs to increase this tax revenue they have to work on collection of direct taxes right so a similar looking concept is tax elasticity but it refers to changes in tax revenue in response to changes in tax rate so basically tax elasticity is like that how are people going to respond if government changes the tax rate right so here we are measuring the relationship with tax rate change let's say if for this group government changes this 10 percent to 12 percent and for this group 20% is changed to 25%. Now, then in this case, the, ta the changes that come in uh, tax revenue, that is elasticity, that is measured by elasticity. Because we are measuring the changes in tax in relation to change in tax rate, right? But if you calculate the change in tax revenue in relation to GDP. You are finding the relationship between GDP and tax revenue. Whereas in case of tax elasticity, you are finding a relationship between tax revenue and the tax rate, right? So in first case, where we find it in relation to GDP, it is tax buoyancy. And in the other case, it is tax elasticity. So I hope uh, the concept of uh, tax buoyancy and its uh, distinction with tax elastic elasticity is clear to you, right? So, let's move ahead to second question for today. Okay, here is your second question which says Lakshmi Enterprises company has to pay a number of creditors. It has decided to follow a structure which requires that higher tiered creditors receive interest and principal payments while the lower tiered creditors, they receive principal payments after the higher tiered creditors have be, uh, uh, had been paid in full, right? From the options given below, uh, that's uh, from the options given below, select the correct name for this structure. So basically, this is a payment structure that how a company which has a lot of creditors, it is going to pay to its creditors by following which system. So you have to select the name of that particular system, right? So this is a common term. Uh, you uh, you can uh, uh, easily find it in newspapers. Moving ahead to the solution, and the solution is option E. Option E means waterfall structure. 
वॉटर फॉल स्ट्रक्चर राइट सो सी बिफोर कमिंग टू देमेंट सिस्टम लेट्स ट्राई टू इमेजिन वॉटर फॉल दैट इज फॉलोइंग राइट नाउ इफ यू प्लेस सम अ बकेट बिलो दिस एंड अ बकेट बिलो दिस फर्स्ट बकेट देन फर्स्ट द वॉटर विल पोर इन टू दिस बकेट एंड वेन इट गेट्स फिल्ड अप टू द्रिम देन द वॉटर इज गोइंग टू गेट इन टू दिस बकेट सो this is the same logic which is being applied in the payment system that the company or the debtor who has to pay to a lot of creditors that particular debtor pays to a creditor who is high tiered and then waits for this high tiered creditor its payment to exhaust in full and then comes to the next section which is the lower tiered creditor right now what is the meaning of high tiered and lower tiered basically uh, we have done classification of credit creditors on some basis and we have put into different categories so the category which lies at a higher rank is going to pay is going to be paid first and after that lower tiered creditors are going to be paid right so usually they are classified according to the according to the cost of borrowing in each case that means a creditor who is charging a higher cost of borrowing or who is charging a higher interest to debtor is paid off first so that that higher rate of cost of borrowing can be saved and then uh, the debtor moves on to the another creditor who is charging lesser interest to pay them off right so there can be different basis but usually it is cost of borrowing someone who charges a higher interest is ranked above and paid off first as compared to another uh, creditor right so it might be possible that some secured creditors are paid first because they are secured by their contract and some unsecured creditors are paid only if the secured creditors are paid in full so this mechanism of classifying them into different categories and then paying them off uh, by tranche by tranche this is known as waterfall structure right or waterfall mechanism okay debtors typically structure these schemes into tranches by uh, categorizing different creditors prioritize highest principal loans first because they are also likely to be most expensive as i told you the one who is most expensive is paid off first works best for a company repaying more than one loan assume this company has three operating loans each with different interest rate so this is the same example i just told you right company makes principal and interest payments to the costliest loan first and after that they move on to the cheaper loan once the most expensive loan is paid off company can make all the interest and payments on to the next one and then more expensive on to the next more expensive loan right okay waterfall payments are common for borrowers with certain tranches of debt protects the lenders who are higher up in the debt structure so it is beneficial for those lenders who are ranked first right moving ahead okay this is your third question it also talks about waterfall mechanism investment waterfall mechanics are detailed in the distribution section of private placement memorandum there are two common type of waterfall structures dash which favors the general partner and dash which is more investor friendly and uh, and uh, favors investors much right moving ahead to the solution and the option which is correct is option e option e means american and european so american here in the first blank and european here so guys here we are talking about the waterfall mechanism in terms of an investment fund so let's say there is a pool or a corpus of money right in which many investors have put in their money right and obviously there are there are going to be the managers and owners the managers or the partners who have initiated this fund and who are taking care of management of this fund basically the internal management right and there are many other 
investors. So this is a simple example. Many investors putting their money together, partners, they who own the company, who own this fund, uh, they have also put in some of their, uh, they have also put in their capital and they have all collected this money and they are going to invest it into many investment avenues, right? Now, when they are going to receive the returns from this return investment avenue, how are they going to distribute this return or this reward is what is this investment waterfall mechanism. They are also going to use a waterfall mechanism here. So, I am going to tell you in simple terms, in this American structure, which is more partner friendly which favors the general partners in where in this usually what happens is the reward is divided deal by deal that means the partner who is managing the fund who is the partner who is managing this pool of money that partner particularly takes some cut on the on every deal that this fund deals in right so basically the partner the owners are taking their money out their share of money out before the investors but in case of european waterfall structure who gets to uh, who uh, who gets the money first the investors and once all the investors have been paid off according to their uh, according to whatever uh, is uh, is uh, liable to them then the partners they have their share right so the european one is riskier for partners because sometimes uh, the reward is exhausted in paying off the investors and nothing is left for the partners and it becomes really difficult for them to recover their capital, right? So, this is the basic difference. Here you can see American style distribution, deal by deal basis, not at the, not at a macro fund level, right? So, they, they might take a cut or they might take uh, some share of profit at every deal. They might have fixed some percentage for it. American schedule spreads the total risk all over the deals more beneficial to journal partners of the fund rather than the investors of the fund. Allows for the managers to get paid prior to investors. Right? This is what I told you. European style schedule applied at aggregate fund level, not deal by deal basis, but whatever the fund is earning uh, at a, at, at, in totality. With this schedule, all distributions will go to investors first and manager will not participate in profit taking until investors have been paid off and satisfied. Drawback for managers because it becomes difficult to recover their capital, right? So, moving ahead to the next question. Okay, this is the next question for today which says Mr. Ashutosh is the project manager in an auto parts manufacturing firm. He has been noticing that, that the equipment they use for production is becoming obsolete. Now, they might benefit by buying some advanced technology machinery. This decision of buying or not buying the new machinery has been left to Ashutosh. Which of the following rate do you think can help him to take this decision? So guys, uh, think for a while that this person who is trying to make a decision that whether to indulge in this project or not which of the following rates is going to be most beneficial for him. Moving ahead to the solution and the correct option for this question is option D that is the hurdle ratio. Hurdle ratio means, so it is basically a rate, minimum rate of return that a project has to earn. Basically see, let's say, uh, you are going to appear for some exams, right? You are putting in so much of effort, you are putting so much hard work for your exams and now you want some return on it. What is the return? The return are the marks that you are going to get in your examinations. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, right. So, the input that you are putting in here is the effort and hard work and the output you are going to get is marks in each subject, right? So, let's say there is a subject you do not like much, right? So, you know that uh, no matter how much you study for it, you are not going to give get some good marks on it. So, you decide that let me not waste my time studying more into that subject. I might just get passing marks and I can 
pull those marks in some other subject that I am good at, right? So basically, you decide a cutoff for each subject that in this that in English I am going to score 90 out of 100 at least. Uh, if I am putting this much of hard work, I should secure this much of marks. In maths, I am going to get 90. Or in in let's say in a subject like history, you are you are you are setting a cutoff of 70. So according to the effort that you are willing to put, and uh, according to the level of hard work or effort that you are willing to put, you are expecting a return according to that, and you are deciding a cutoff that if I do not get so basically in history, let's assume you are not very good at history. That is why you think I might not put put much effort into it. That is why the cutoff is uh, the cutoff marks that you have to get. You have uh, decided it at a lower level, right? So basically, according to that cutoff, you decide how much hard work you have to put in, right? So similar is the uh, concept with companies. Whenever they have to decide that whether they should enter into a product uh, enter into a project or not they decide a, ca a rate of return that they should earn and if they if uh, after analyzing and researching about the product product project they think that they are not getting that much of rate they decide not to pursue it and if they get uh, that uh, rate of return or more than that then they decide to pursue it right so that rate is known as hurdle rate, the cutoff that they decide or the rate that they have to earn, right, from a project. So hurdle rate is the minimum rate of return on a project or investment required by a manager or investor. Allows the companies to make important decisions whether or not to pursue a specific project. That is why this rate is going to be uh, product, uh, the productive for Ashutosh. He can fix a rate of return that he wants to earn from this project and then compare the estimated returns of the project with this hurdle rate. If the estimated returns are high, they can go for the project and if not, then they decide to chuck the project. Okay, hurdle rate describes appropriate compensation for risk present. So basically, the job of hurdle rate is to decide that, okay, I am taking so much of risk, I am putting this much of effort, what is the return that I should get in uh, as a reward for it? So the riskier the project, the higher the hurdle rate because then the risk taker is expecting a higher compensation. In order to determine the rate, following are some areas for uh, following are some of the areas that must be taken into consideration associated risks also how to decide this rate by uh, researching about these factors what are the risks associated what is the cost of capital so if you are going to invest some funds then what is going to be the cost of those funds returns of other possible other alternatives that are available to you right after that companies they often use the cost of capital as the hurdle rate and they add a risk premium to it basically they see that okay this much of money i need and this is the cost of money so this at least i should earn this and this much is the risk i'm taking so i should be compensated this much for it they add uh, these two and they uh, usually they put this rate as the hurdle rate like these are two major components while deciding hurdle rate uh, the cost of capital and the risk premium right so moving ahead to the last question of the video. Okay, this is a question. This is the last question for today, which says Mukesh is a regular consumer of tobacco and alcohol. He is an operator of machines at a steel plant. Superior has scolded him for consuming these things at factory premises. Although he is an efficient worker, received a bonus last month, but last week he was found to be operating a machine under the influence of alcohol. His superior decided to take the bonus back from him as a penalty, which provision has been used by the superior here. So, I hope you understand this case, very simple case, right? So, basically, he had this particular person, this particular employee, Mukesh, he had been provided with some sort of uh, monetary benefit for or as a reward for his performance. And now the management has decided to take it back because of some misconduct that he has been indulging into you have to select that which provision is being used here moving ahead to the solution and the correct option for this question is option c that means the clawback 
provision so i think the name helps you to identify it the claw back provision that you are uh, trying to extend the claw and get some uh, benefits back that you as an employer has have already provided to some employee right so very simple provision whenever management of a company or an employer decides to take some reward that has already been paid to employee back because of some fraud that he has been indulging into because of some uh, mis uh, because of some bad practices because of some misconduct then this clawback provision can be used okay here you can see contractual provision that requires an employee to return money already paid to him usually this is used as a penalty to discourage such bad behavior right acts as insurance policy in the event of fraud misconduct drop in performance of company or poor employee performance right whenever the employee is not performing correctly so this is an insurance okay my question to you here is that this is an insurance for whom am i talking about the employer or am i talking about the employee so this provision provides insurance to whom i think it's a very simple question and i expect to see a lot of answers in the comments provisions typically involved incentive pay like bonuses or other profits right and these are the these are the profits that an employee has to return under this provisions primarily used in financial industry but can also be found in government contracts and for pensions right so after the financial crisis of 2008 because here in this crisis i think we have discussed this crisis in an elaborate manner in one of the previous sessions so this financial crisis uh in this crisis there were many big banks or financial conglomerates that were found, whose management uh, was found to be inefficient or they were found to be engaging in some bad practices just to magnify their profits so to uh, to basically to put these uh, managers in their place or to prevent them from doing such activities this provision has become these clauses clawback clauses have become have become stricter after the crisis of 2008 to put a control over the incentive pay of the top management right so guys these were the five questions for today i hope you learned something new from this video if you did then do not forget to hit the like button and if you have any doubt then do not forget to mention it on the video uh, in the comments and we'll try to take it up as soon as possible so guys i'll see you in the next session so till then you try to provide answer to the question i asked and keep your studies carrying keep your studies going on take care of yourself and i'll see you in the next session thank you for being here